on it or letting people in. Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are excited to present strategies, tips, and tools, and tricks to overcome conflicting priorities, a subject that is near and dear to our heart. My name is Molly Giannis, and I'm the founder of Echo Consulting. Um, for today, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with questions as we go. I will try to take a couple of breaths in between. We have a lot of content to cover. We are recording this session, so you are welcome to take notes, but be aware that we will be sending this deck afterwards, as well as a link to the recording. Um, you can unmute yourself, ask questions. Feel free to engage on the chat as well. Um, my associate Melissa um, will be monitoring chat and we'll reach out with questions that make sense. Um, and then just so you know, at the end, we will send out a survey to ask how we um, how you enjoyed the webinar um, and what you got out of it. Um, really quick, and I want to get to the good stuff. So Echo Consulting, we're a project management services firm. We offer fractional project management services, so teams that don't need full-time project managers. We offer software platform selection and planning, strategic planning and prioritization of annual planning, um, program and portfolio management. We stand up PMOs and P um, project management and task management systems. Um, and then we also have training and mentorship programs for budding project managers. So with that, I'm going to jump in on what you should expect today. We're going to go into specific strategies, tools, and tactics that we use with our clients um, to overcome conflicting priorities. Um, so I won't dig too deep into this. Um, I like to start off with a quote, action expresses priorities. Um, so actually actions versus just talking about it, um, you know, a good old Gandhi quote. We're going to dive right in with our first tool, and this might sound from teams of two or three all the way up to employers that have thousands of employees, having a single list of all of your projects and initiatives that you can look and dig into is the number one first step that most companies do not have is a single place of all of the different ideas, projects, potential work that could happen. Um, so with that said, throughout the webinar today, we are going to be using a um, example that I hope sticks with you. Um, we're going to do what's called the house on fire example. So you will see this throughout. Um, so the scenario is your home is on fire. So I want to take a minute and think about your home is on fire. You are not at your house and someone called you and wants to know what to tell the firefighters to do. Your house is on fire. What do you tell them what to do? The first thing you have to do is have a list. Um, and so with that said, we're hoping that maybe making sure that any people that are in your house is on that list. If you have any pets, if you have any personal belongings and if your house is on fire, but you know it, it's a slow burn that you might want to go in and grab. Um, so once you have a list of everything, be aware that the, when you're writing down the list, that is actually not the time to prioritize. First, you come up with all of the different things that you need to address, and then you go ahead and prioritize. If you try to prioritize first, you slow yourself down, you end up having a barrier to you know actually coming up with all of the different ideas. Start big, everything that you have to think about, um, and then the next step will be to actually prioritize. So um, with that said, we use a very basic, um, you know, with our extremely small entry level teams, we use what we call a priority list. Um, so we take those ideas, we put them into a list, and then we start, you know, um, providing examples like actual priority, critical, high, medium, low. We start capturing some information about urgency, impact, and if there's a larger team, you know, what team or department, who's requesting it, when they're looking to have it. So again, starting at the very basics, having a list that has all of the different ideas, projects, initiatives that might come into play, okay? When you're riding, only the race in which you're riding is important. So the next step is to actually eliminate. So you have this list of things um, and your home is on fire, but you probably don't want to tell the um, firefighting team that's going to be risking their lives to come and go into your burning house um, every single thing at once, right? So you want to start eliminating the things that you don't need to worry about talking to them about, okay? So probably your couch and furniture, food and your refrigerator, probably aren't the things that you want to 
to the firefighter on the phone about about what things that you need to take out of your house so that they can spray it down. Uh, components is eliminating, you know what, just like we don't even need to focus on this talk about this right now. Um, one of the tactics uh, you might have heard of Warren Buffett, he calls it the 25 five rule. There's a great story about how his pilot, you know, explained using this rule. But the idea is, is you have to you narrow it down to only five and you do not look at anything else on the other list until those five are completed, right? And then you pull in the next five and the next five and you focus fully on those. So anyways, bonus tactic, you can look it up, Warren Buffett's 25 five rule. Um, he's a, you know, if it works for him, maybe it'll work for you. All right, so how, let's eliminate the things we don't need to talk about, our family, um, laptop, our photos. The next piece is, thing. So the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but instead to schedule your priorities. So with that, we're going to be talking about two different types of tactics. One is as an individual contributor, like managing your own schedule and the priorities of you uh, that you are working on. And then we'll be talking a little bit about how a team might set this up to make sure that you guys are aligned on priorities. So as you can probably notice, we're going to start really basic, fly through that, and then get into um, a little bit more complex tactics. So first, Make sure you have a list. Second, eliminate the things that should not, you, you know for sure, like obviously we're not focusing on this right now. Um, and then the next thing is to schedule those highest priority items. So uh, the key to prioritize, not what's on your schedule, but schedule your priorities. So we're gonna actually start with a really quick calendar, right? So this is like a personal time segmentation approach. This idea that you have a personal calendar, you're gonna actually schedule heads down time for your priorities. There's a lot of research that says that most people work best in the morning when they're first logging in. So if you have kind of deep dive time to schedule that in your mornings and to try to keep your meetings and um, more collaborative exercises um, in the afternoon, you know you best in terms of when you can concentrate and deep dive into priorities. Um, this is an example of how I might manage my top three for the week. Um, what you'll do, you notice, is that I actually have it broken up. One of the tactics that I find extremely useful is to actually prep for my deep dive time so that I'm not uh, like starting out kind of looking deeply on into an issue or problem or writing or whatever that, um, you know, project that I have testing. Um, I'm actually spending time the day before prepping for my deep dive time. Um, and that way I'm gathering all the resources, making sure I have all of the you know, access I need, um, whatever that looks like, I'm doing some brainstorming. And then I prep myself so that when I first sit down to focus deep dive on my on whatever priority work I'm doing, um, I'm already set up to really you know, dive in and I'm not gonna be scattered. Um, so I like to grab time at the end of the day to prep for my deep dive time in the beginning of the day. So. Um, it's not about having time, it's about making time. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, what this looks like from uh, prioritizing from a team standpoint. And to do that, I need to kind of walk through how work kind of comes in. And again, management side of things, but this can also be used for, you know, operational work that's more day to day. Um, so there's, there's, a high level of process associated with the intake of work, reviewing and assigning out the work, and then completing the work. And so we have identified three different personas. In some cases, these are the same people, right? The intake might be you come up with an idea, you need to figure out when you're going to be able to work on it, and then you're completing the work. Or it might, in a larger team, be an outside department is making a request of the marketing team, and then the marketing manager is reviewing it and assigning it out to specific people. And then, um, Melissa, we are uh, recording, correct? Okay. Um, and then we are going ahead and completing the work. And maybe there's three or four or five people that are actually um, completing the work that came in for this request. OK, so we have requesters of work, reviewers of work, and then the doers of work. Um, one thing I like to call out here is in this process, requester goes ahead and like asks for work and that could be via I mean it used to be at the water cooler like in conversation in the hall it could be an instant message it can be an email it could be an action item that comes out of a meeting um, you might you know be mature enough you guys have an actual intake form of ideas of how new work comes in um, for most teams it comes in from a lot of different places um, but once that requester has put in a request for new work 
too often there's kind of a communication breakdown here where they don't actually know what the status of it is. Is someone actually working on it? Um, is someone actually reviewing it? Is it at the bottom of someone's invoices uh, or, or inbox or something? So it's important to be able to have um, visibility into the status of this work um, and be able to provide input throughout the process. Um, and then at the end, once the work's actually done, to be able to communicate back to the request uh, you know, this work is done, um, you know, and they have this approval and the approval process doesn't need to be formal. It depends on the size of the team you're working with and the maturity of the organization you're working in, but some sort of acknowledgement that yes, I requested something and you delivered it. From a reviewer standpoint, they need to see the, the request come in, hopefully in a some sort of consolidated form, maybe a list of all these different things, but in oftentimes, again, most organizations, you get requests from a lot of different places. If you're an individual contributor, you know, you might be getting requests from your manager, you might be getting requests from other people in other departments or teammates to help and things like that, right? Um, so the, the reviewer is gonna review and assign out the work. Maybe they have resourcing visibility in terms of who has the most capacity, maybe they don't. Um, and then once the reviewer assigns it out to someone, maybe they're assigning it via an email or maybe you have a task management system or a project management system where you're assigning a task. Um, they have to then see the status of the task and they want to confirm kind of when that work is going to be done. Right, so then the doer completes the work and then they want to see that the person that requested it, you know, if their reviewer approvers in there, like that the work that they completed is actually, um, you know, approved and is going to be used in shape or form. So I just want to walk through that high level process. We spend a lot of time deep diving with this with a lot of different size teams, but um, I think this is really helpful for kind of the next phase of prioritization and conflicting priorities to make sure we understand what these tools are addressing. So this is an intake process for new work. Um, so in a lot of cases, especially if you're working with a team, you might have multiple different projects going on and operational work that you're doing for your role or your team. Um, and so it's important to align across the team to make sure that you all know what you're working on and why you're working on it. And so this is a team department priority review cadence um, that we work with a lot of teams on. Um, typically there is some sort of weekly um, review as a team in terms of the work so that you can go ahead and um, balance out the workloads if that makes sense or at least give a heads up that you have an escalation because you have something more than your capacity you're not going to be able to get to maybe reporting out because someone else is dependent on the work that you're doing um, and this is usually something that happens like within a team or within a department right like that weekly cadence um, Sometimes there are also weekly meetings for cross-functional teams, and that's great too. So that's that weekly meeting. Um, depending on the culture, sometimes you can, you know, more of like a sprint cadence, so maybe more every two weeks is another example, but this is kind of progress of all these different divergent pieces of work, how those come together and those dependencies, interdependencies between work. Um, on a monthly basis, uh, this is like a typical planning cadence for a team. So making sure you know kind of what your goals are for the month. Um, and kind of what those accomplishments are, what those targets are. If you can make it measurable for, you know, a, a, a key measurable goal, that's great. That's what we work with our teams on. Um, in addition to the monthly meeting, which is more of like a planning, sprint planning kind of idea, um, there's oftentimes a quarterly report out, and that can either be done at a team or a, an organization side, uh, uh, level, maybe multiple teams under like a specific senior leader or oftentimes, you know, our companies will quarterly report outs on, you know, the goals of the company and how you're doing. Um, so this is more of a reporting out function. This is monthly is typically more of a planning function. Weekly is a semi planning, semi reporting. Quarterly typically is higher level. About the really high level recommendation for like a priority review cadence team communication um, of different priorities. OK, so again, very dependent on culture, but this concept of, you know what I mean, reviewing all the different components, bringing it together on a weekly basis, making plans with a specific goal in mind on a monthly basis um, and both quarterly planning and goals as well as reporting out um, at a larger organization level, um, you know, how you are tracking goal of the organization. We've 
done our very basic high level tools and, and strategies. So make sure that you have a list of all the different work and ideas that you have, um, whether you're an individual contributor or you're a team. You can manage that list in Excel. You can manage that list in OneNote. You can manage that list in sticky notes. One of my favorite things. Um, you also manage that list in a task management system um, or a project management system. Um, if you have any questions, you don't have a task management system, you're looking for one, you're a smaller team, we have lots of recommendations. Melissa's actually doing a, um, a upcoming webinar, I think next week on ClickUp, which is one of our favorite free entry level task management tools. Um, all right, and then so schedule, list, and eliminate. So now we're going to go to the next level up. And for these, oftentimes we are going to be talking about it more from a team standpoint versus individual, but all of this can be related regardless of whether you're a manager of a specific team or a member of a specific team, um, whether you are senior leader that has multiple teams underneath you um, and it can be applied even if you're an individual right having specific goals for the work of what you're accomplishing your personal goals um, it, it still works so with that we're going to keep going and we're going to talk about trade-offs so we're going to go back to our house is on fire example right so oh my gosh my house is on fire so we had this list of things that we might want to work on and sometimes it can be really intimidating to say oh my gosh i have this list of 20 30 things how do i know what is most important and one of the <laughs> the best methods to do this is is called trade-off it's also called pairwise comparison and the app that i always refer to when i'm thinking about this is um is it, i think it's tinder right so a little bit pre my time in terms of online dating but this concept of left or right or like this or that like it's a really quick instinctual decision that you make over and over and over again so um you know what i have this tool i want to get on my house but how do i know what is most important and one of the easiest times to start breaking it down is literally just looking at Important. So we are hoping here at Echo Consulting that you think that your family is more important than the books. And that's our that's our hope. Obviously, each to their own. Um, we live in Vermont, a consulting, and you may notice that uh, some people might select their pets over their family. But again, if we're talking with firefighters, <laughs> hopefully we're making sure first that all of the people, right? But between our beloved furry friends and our computer or technology. Maybe we think it's most important that they go in and find our living beings in the house after that. Now, this is a harder decision, right? Maybe you have albums or pictures on your wall or like a very specific thing that is irreplaceable um, versus your technology, or maybe all of your pictures are already digitalized. And so, you know, you say, hey, if you can, if you still have time, like go grab my computer, right? These are a little bit easier decisions to make than looking at a list of 20 or 30 or 40 different ideas and trying to like rank 1 to 40 for that. That can be a really intimidating um, concept. And so what we're going to talk about. Oh, um, so anyways, this is the concept of trade offs. It's also called pairwise comparison. It's called this or that. Um, this is a strategy for looking at this huge list and deciding which one is more important and making, you know, instinctual gut this or that decisions. OK. How do we use that? So some day is not a day of the week. So when I was just talking about that, when I'm looking at this list of like 20, 30, 40 different things that I could be working on, one of the things, especially with a team that I'm often trying times working with them on is overcoming what we call analysis paralysis. So this idea that we have to overanalyze and overthink a situation and we're looking at these 40 things, we don't know where to start. And basically we spend so much time in the decision making process that we become paralyzed um, and that no action is actually decided on. And so unfortunately, a lot of teams experience this where they have this big meeting with a bunch of people and they're all kind of like, what about this or that or that? And there's no real clean answer and we just like get paralyzed and it, it's not useful use of time. So some of the tools we're going to be talking about next are how do we overcome this analysis paralysis? And perhaps the best strategy that we use with our teams is what we call progressive elaboration. So this understanding that as you get additional information, you provide additional detail in the plan and you can update the, um, the estimates of how long it's going to take or when it needs to be done by, like as additional information comes in. But the point is, is to not be paralyzed and not be able to do nothing, right? But to actually be able to, you know, based on our current assumptions, what we know right now, like this is the priorities, but hey, 
by the way, like things are going to change. These are the things we need to know in order to really validate that. So let's talk about that in action. Has everyone heard of analysis paralysis? Maybe you've experienced those meetings um, and then progressive elaboration, this idea that you don't need a perfect plan up front. Finishing returns right to, to planning. You actually have to kind of, um, you know, start with something and understand that it's going to flex as you go. So we're going to go back to our favorite scenario. You're we're going to think about this the same way again. You're always going to remember this webinar being like, oh my gosh, they made me pick between my family and my dog. All right, so anyways, scenario, your home is on fire. All right, well, that's great. We've identified that you have pets in your house, right? But from a firefighter standpoint, you probably need to be a little bit more specific, right? Because you might have a dog, you might have a cat or multiple cats, you might have fish, hamsters, they're probably all over your house. So when you're doing your first list, yeah, you're just saying like family, pets, you know, et cetera. But then you probably need to be a little bit more granular so that you're ordering the individual tasks, the individual components underneath pets or furry friends a little bit further. I guess fish, they're not really furry, but you get the idea, right? So scenario, your house is on fire. You then need to, you know, articulate a little bit more about, you know, what pets are in your house and where they might be. Um, when you think about technology, oftentimes we have multiple pieces of technology. Probably you don't want them to take your TV out of your house or off your wall, but you might have like a laptop, you might have a, um, a phone, or you might have, you know, multiple tablets or something like that that might have pictures on it. So trying to be a little bit more granular in our requirements of what we need to get out of our house, right? So what technology you're looking at. Same thing with photographs. We have a so photographs, right? So it might be picture frames on the wall. It might be albums. It might be an actual digital camera. Remember when we had those? I think we're all pretty much with uh, phones now, but you get the concept if you have a really nice camera or something that has very special photos for you. So again, becoming a little bit more granular using, you know, progressive elaboration to understand the actual components um, of a given. Makes sense. House is on fire. What do we really need out of our house? So. Before we move on, the one of the things that we work with a lot of individuals on, and I think we have a good blog on this, so we should include this in the um, the follow up for for any attendees, um, is how to ask. So so this is like an understanding that like you know you got pets and you know which pets you have, so you have all the information, so you can you can articulate what that information is in terms of what pets you have, right? But in a lot of cases, you don't have all the information, and you're being asked by multiple people for multiple different things, and so in that case, you don't hold other people that hold the information you need in order to make the decision, and so we actually articulate what the options are to someone that's asking you something and you maybe don't have capacity to do every single thing at exactly the time they're asking for. I know Melissa's not familiar with this example at all. I never ask her to do more than she can do in a day. Um, so anyways, um, so in the next slide, we're gonna be talking a little bit about how to articulate, you know, whether the this or that statement of like this work or that statement um, or that work, um, or how to get additional information about the requirements to understand when the this has to happen and in what order so you know um, you know how to prioritize your work. So the first one is exactly what we talked about with the trade off, which is like, is this a high priority or that or then that and giving specific examples of requests that you might have taken for work or a project or something like that. Um, so in our blog, I think like the, the main take is like you never just ask your manager or your team member like what is the priority that is not enough information and that's just you know escalating a problem not really providing solutions and enough information for like a hated answer um so the the first thing you can do is say like is this a higher priority than that right and specifically fill in what this is and what that is um the the next question is should i stop working like and this is like even more brutal like very straightforward melissa has never asked me this question um should i stop working on this right this project this work this marketing email this whatever this is to work on that so the request that's coming in and then the other way is a little bit is will it work to if i deliver this idea or project or you know piece of work on this date so being like really specific to say like hey can 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 this be delivered on this time frame so that i can get this other thing done by that date so like giving the person that you're asking to options and enough information and they might not have the answer for you 
giving them something to think about in a way that you know they can provide you better input on how you prioritize your okay we have so many different examples of this but um too many words on a slide as you know but you know this will be sent out afterward which is know this is important you're validating that the request that they're asking you for is like it's important you get it um and and articulating that maybe you could use support from someone else so this is this concept of like delegating work being like you know yes this is important i really want to work on this but i have this other thing instead of saying but you're saying i could use support from i could delegate to this person um to make sure that it's completed by blank this state so this is all great in a you know very happy utopia um, standpoint this information is not always available and you don't always have this off the top of your head when you get a request but this is what you're working towards right like giving them enough information to to be able to give you the input you need to best prioritize your work and make sure that you are focused on the most important things to contribute for your team and, and for yourself um uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about with teams, we, again, project management is dependencies. So understanding that the work that you might be doing or your team might be doing is blocking work from another team or another person. Um, so making sure when you get a new request that might distract you from what you're currently working on, that you're articulating that there's a dependency um, from another team that's waiting on you um, and, and making sure that you, you know, understand you know which should come first so again providing information back in the question to the person that might have more information than you on the priorities um, of a given request and then the last one is this is a tool that we work with a lot of or a question we ask with other teams if you're getting requests from other departments and other people um but that the work really should be coming in through a manager or through a specific like traffic cop type person that's prioritizing work, you know, making sure, you know, letting them know, committing to them that you're going to make sure that the information gets to the right place to be prioritized. Um, but and then articulating that you will follow up with that person, um, but not giving them a date or committing to anything in the moment. So not over committing to something, but providing them a clear understanding of when they should expect to hear back from you on that and where you're going to put the information, you know, and kind of it's, you know, managing up a little bit, but just like, you know, I'm going to make sure that this person's aware of this request and I'll get back to you by the state with an understanding of where this is at. There are a lot of other questions you can ask, but the important takeaway is don't just ask what is the priority that doesn't get you anywhere. Um, you need to talk about it in terms of relative terms to other work to other time frames and give options of things that you could be working on instead. Any questions? I'm going to pause for a second here, Melissa. Anything? Nope. All right, so um, next thing we're talking about is a tactic we call it the Ivy League method. Um, I actually use kind of a bastardized version of it. It's just the top three methodology. Um, the concept is, is that um, at the end of the day, and usually I do recommend this at the end of the day versus the beginning of the day, you just think about, you know, these are my top three priorities. You can do your top priorities for a day, your top three priorities for a week, your top three priorities for whatever that, you know, amount of time that makes sense to you. These are your top three priorities and all of the other things that you are working on. Like, sure, you're going to get other requests from other teams. That happens to a lot of us. We are all expected to multitask. Um, but but really knowing in a very concrete way and whether you're analog and you like to write things down on sticky notes like me, whether you you know include it on you know your home screen or something like that, but like very clearly articulating these are my top three priorities, both for you as an individual or for a team. and that if that does change you are either you know crossing it off moving something down but you are basically saying that this is not part of my top three sure it's something that i'm thinking about people are asking me about but it's like these are my top three and having a very clear understanding of what those top three things are okay i think the ivy league method if i remember correctly melissa it actually like starts with a list of six things right and says you can't look at anything else off your list until that it's very similar to the warren buffett rule that we talked about but always being able to articulate on a given day, on a given week, like these are my top three priorities. Um, one of the tips that I give here for a lot of teams that I actually know a lot of people that's really helped is that you should be setting your top three at the end of the day, not the beginning of day. Um, so that when you're signing off, you are signing off knowing that you have a very clear um, understanding of what your top three priorities are for the next day. Okay, 
Any questions on the Ivy League method? So this works as an individual. It's also really helpful for a team, right? On that weekly planning, like what are those top three priorities? What do we need to get done to feel like we are successful as a team for this week? Eisenhower method. Now, some of these names you might not recognize, but I think you're probably going to recognize the graph that we're going to be talking about next. So you may have seen something. So this concept of important, not important, urgent, not urgent. So this is a problem that a lot of teams have, which is the loudest person <laughs> and the, you know, the most recent request gets prioritized, um, prioritized. Or, you know, things that maybe are important, but not quite as urgent because they don't have a deadline this week. OK. So in the Eisenhower method, we're going to go back to our beautiful example of the burning house. You will never burning house and we'll think about the different components that we want to get out of our house in terms of their urgency as well as their importance, right? And we're going to put them on this graph. So I'm hoping that you will agree that the humans in your house are probably both urgent from a fire standpoint as well as important to you and hopefully your furry friends in the same way, shape or form. Probably your couch is not urgent or important, so you'll see that it's down at the bottom right hand corner. OK, so most important, most urgent up here. Then you start getting, you know, these are kind of the obvious ones, and it's it's really great to be able to do the obvious one first, the one that you're all aligned with and you all agree on. Um, this exercise can be done, you know, I know that a lot of us are virtual still, so this can totally be done in a quick graphic, like in a whiteboarding app or even just, you know, in a slide or something. Um, but uh, I, I do this a lot of times in annual planning, actually with sticky notes where all the different ideas are sticky notes and you kind of move them around of how people think they are in terms of urgent and not planning. So for example, like basic needs met, like obviously you're going to need clothing and you need a place to sleep. Um, it's really important, but it's probably not urgent that it happens like that. It's the specific thing that's in your house, right? There are probably opportunities that you can, you know, find things for um, for clothing and, and a place to sleep um, that's not your house. Um, and then you have things like pictures that are really urgent because they could. Um, they. That, you know, they could burn, they could get smoked, they might not be replaceable, right? Um, but they might not be as important as, you know, having clothing, um, you know, or a place to sleep. So uh, again, different people think different things, just my example, but you can, you can kind of think about it in from your own perspective of like, what is the most important to you? What means the most to you? What's the most urgent? And you start putting all these different ideas out there. Um, and, and this is another way to kind of slice and look any questions about the Eisen? Okay, so the Eisen is, you know, easier to do as an individual. When you start thinking about doing this as a team, especially where we play together, this really time consuming if you have a team of eight or 10, or maybe you have a department of like 20 or 30 people, right? Being able to use sticky notes and moving around in a graphic like isn't super efficient. So it really depends on the size of the organization, like how you take this first cut of things, right? So we're going to be talking about some other tools um, to kind of help streamline this process a little bit more. Lack of direction, not lack of time is the problem. We all have 24 hours in the day. So strategic alignment. So now we're going to be talking a little bit more again, like the organization as a whole, love teams. How do we make sure that we're all marching in the same direction to our organization? Um, so for strategic alignment mapping, um, this is an exercise we do with a lot of teams. Sorry for my scribbles in the picture, but the piece that I want to get across is that um, strategic goals have multiple different levels within an organization. There are oftentimes company strategic goals and initiatives that might be a year or multiple year. There might be executive leadership goals. So if you're part of like the marketing organization or the IT organization, like your senior leader probably has a set of goals or KPIs that they need to hit or objectives they need to hit to be successful. Um, you know, it, it, for that for that department. Um, then depending on again the size you might have another level of goals that is specific to teams and departments and you know again performance indicators or numbers that you have to hit metrics you have to hit um your manager might have their own goals and their own career objectives right and things that they want to accomplish or prove that they can accomplish with their team in order to be successful and considered um, to be successful and maybe have career growth 
you have individual work goals of things that you want to do and you're passionate about and how you want to show that you're a great individual contributor. Or maybe you're even looking at, you know, getting a more diverse experience because you're looking for, you know, other opportunities to grow maybe outside of the company or um, in a different role in the company, right? So you have individual goals. Then you might have your manager, you might have direct reports goals that you're managing too, um, and then personal goals that are outside of work. So there's lots of different types of goals and objectives and initiatives. And when you start to prioritize, if you think about it from an individual perspective, you want to be aware of those different goals um, and be able to start mapping them out. Um, this is another thing of progressive elaboration too. So a lot of organizations might have like really high level annual goals of like diversifying revenue streams or, you know, getting to 1 million, I don't know, 100,000 customers or whatever that is, right? Um, but then they actually break it down into initiatives. So I, I'm not sure from how familiar you are, but like some of the stra strategies here, are like OKRs you might have heard of. Um, there's lots of different kind of goal setting strategies. Um, at the most basic from like an individual standpoint, um, we we recommend just like starting off with like a smart goal, if you've ever heard of that. Um, if not, you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and timely. Um, but then starting to look at how those map. So how do these individual work that you're doing or bringing to the table map back to the team goals, map back to the leadership initiatives and map back to the overarching strategic objectives of the organization? Um, and understanding that hierarchy and understanding how that maps back um, can really help you as an individual leader and as a team member um, contribute to understanding what work is going to have the highest impact for your organization and have the highest value. Um, and we typically are, are motivated by things that we think, you know, contribute to the greater good, in this case, you know, organizational values. <sighs> I just said a lot. I'm going to take a quick breath, but um, more here, a lot more. There's a lot here in terms of like how we set organization company strategic goals. Um, whether it's annually or quarterly, how often that gets updated, um, how they kind of change over time, executive leadership goals of individual people. We oftentimes see this, that there's new senior leaders in an organization that come in, they want to put their stamp on, they have their own flavor, um, you know, bringing those into play, you know, a lot of politics associated with this. Um, sometimes there can be conflicts between, for example, a finance organization and a marketing organization or IT organization. So understanding that there's, you know, some politics associated with where you are in the organization and how your goals map back to them. Um, a lot more here. If you have specific questions about this or, or pain points about this, we can definitely spend some time at the end talking about a couple of examples. So, <laughs> one of my favorite Friends episodes. So, one of the things that's really hard for teams that I work with is understanding that you might have a goal and you might have a plan of attack for that, but that might need to get changed um, over time, right? Like they're not static. These goals are guiding principles or kind of bumpers in place to kind of keep us all going in the direction. But we have to understand that over time, like COVID was such a great example of this for so many organizations that they had done this awesome job making a big plan for 2020. They had a plan, they were executing on it. We were a couple months in and then everything changed. And it was crazy. And all those goals that we had had to be adjusted and they had to be adjusted very much like on the fly because we we didn't know enough information. So again, that analysis paralysis being like, oh my gosh, we don't know anything, but we have to act now. Um, and so critical component, communicate, 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 articulating the priorities of the organization on multiple levels. Um, this is mostly, this slide is mostly from a manager's standpoint or someone that has direct reports, um, but you know, even a leader as a individual contributor, like articulating the priorities at multiple levels for your team, um, mapping, you know, the big picture, like why the work that they're doing is important to the team and to the organization and to the, you know, the, the mission of the organization, right? So mapping, individual work back to the big picture. Planning time for prioritization. Um, and that was really where we talked about it, kind of like scheduling time, whether it's weekly, monthly, whatever cadence makes sense for your organization. It's so important to schedule time for communicating the priority and planning for the fact that they will change, right? One of the things that a lot of organizations struggle with is they have this beautiful annual plan 
and then something new comes up and what do you do with the annual plan? Like, is it completely tra like trashed or do you adjust it depending on the way that you managed it? So understanding and expecting for change, planning for change. And then perhaps the most important thing is empowering teams. Like you cannot, as a manager, literally make every single decision for your employees, nor do you want to. Micromanagement, huge issue, right? We have to empower teams to identify and express relative priority and ask good questions. Um, so those are those slides we talked about in terms of like how you should be asking, you know, relative priority questions, but understand that people manage their time every single day um, and they are having to make these decisions. And if they have a clear understanding of what the what the what the view is and what the like what you're shooting for from a strategy standpoint, they're going to be better equipped to make those decisions correctly and help provide the, the highest impact and value for your organization. Okay. So pivot, pivot. Okay, there we go. So another pain point <laughs> that we work with a lot. So I do a lot of project management in the software development digital transformation space. And so I work with a lot of engineers and um and developers and one of the things that's so hard from a team standpoint is when a project is canceled midstream oh we have a spelling mistake here melissa um so anyways uh one of the things we want to do is make sure that we acknowledge the value that works done to date right so being like you know i know that we were working on this we had a great plan you had made a lot of traction like love that you're gonna love your contributions um you know it's great um and then allow time for grief. So depending on how much time they worked on this, if it's not going to production, if it's not actually being used or implemented, right? Like understand that people feel um, attached to that work. Um, teams feel attached to it. They want to be recognized for their work and like how they're contributing. Um, and then really importantly um, is to highlight the dependencies and synergies. So like, hey, we learned so much from this experience that now we're going to be so much more effective on this other work. We're going to be able to apply these learnings to this other work and make us so much more. So connecting, like drawing a line and bridging the gap between the work that they were working on and the work that they now you now need them focusing on. Um, so these are just a couple of the you know high level strategies to understand that when something that someone's working on has to be paused, has to be stopped, has to be basically trashed, like we're not working, we're not focusing on that, or we're at least like putting it onto a backlog or putting it over there, making sure you you recognize that they are going to have some grief associated with that. Um, but also as a manager and as a leader, like understanding that the time for grief needs to be relative to the actual amount of work put in there. So you shouldn't be grieving and compl And when I say grief, right, the, the way that that oftentimes is articulated in an organization might be potentially like complaints, talking, you know, there's there's other things that can happen there. So um, making sure you're nipping that in the butt, like recognizing that it should be relative to the amount of work that was completed on that. Any other questions on this? Any other things that have worked really well for you when you're having to pivot, you know, in the middle of something and, and people are upset? Okay, we can just keep going. You guys are a really rowdy crowd today. No one is always busy. <laughs> it just depends on what number you are on their priority list. So um, there's been a lot of articles recently and I'm, I'm loving it, which is like we use busy. We've always used busyness kind of as like a badge of honor and like that's really not effective and not good and cause burnout. There's, you know, lots of Harvard Business Review articles on this, right? Forbes, et cetera. So um, understand that when someone's busy 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 what you're really saying is like you're not the highest priority or what you're talking about is not a higher priority than the work that i'm currently working on and as an individual contributor when you're like blocked by your manager or a leader that maybe doesn't have time for that um making sure that you are articulating what the impact of not being able to um, have time with that person um and understanding also articulating what their alternatives are um you know not meeting with them or getting their approval on something, like what the impact of that is, making sure that as an individual contributor, you are articulating what the impact is. Strategic goals. So we talked about strategic alignment, and all the different levels, right? We use strategic goals or prioritization drivers. So these are the actual outcomes that are aligned with your organization's objectives, right? Um, so OKRs, KPIs, et cetera. Um, so here are some strategic goals examples. Um, we actually have a kind of a list of, of ones that we keep track of with our clients. Um, 
ideally, I do want to say best practices. Like when we're talking about goals, we actually want them to be measurable. So it's not increased sales and revenue. That's like really high level kind of objective, but it's like we're looking to increase by 30% in the fiscal year 2021 um, and then actually going into what those um, you know key initiatives are to to, to inform that and like how you're going to get to that right but at a very high level you know these are some of the types now one of the questions we get all the time is like how many strategic goals make the most sense for an organization so we have seen this most effective especially for larger organizations when you're talking about you know four to six, um, maybe five to seven, like four to six, like really strong, well-articulated strategic goals or objectives. Um, and typically those are released on an annual basis and then updated on a quarterly basis. Um, so again, these are extremely high level. We work with teams to really articulate these goals in a much more granular way. Um, and to, 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 oh, introducing Stoline. Okay, so one of the things we've been talking about, it's like, all right, we've got the Eisenhower method, we've got the this or that method, we have, you know, all these different things, but guess what? It's kind of hard to do that um, with a large organization and with a team. And so a lot of times we're coming into organizations and they have kind of built this out in Excel or they have kind of their own homegrown solution of how they rank projects. Um, and so what we're working on is actually a user-friendly app tool that individuals can weigh in on how given pieces of work um, will impact the actual strategic goals of an organization. So Stroline is the name of it. We'll send out a quick link, but it's a tool to help teams focus on the highest impact projects. Let me see if I can, well, so let me just see, I'm gonna stop presenting for a second and go to the actual, um, Give me one second, guys. I just want to show you something really quick. Uh, let's try that. Is everyone seeing Stroline.com? All right. So the concept is, and, and this is taking some of the strategies and tools that we've been talking about and putting it into a web app. So it's not actually like on, you don't have to do it on mobile. This is just an example of this. Um, so the first thing is, is like this concept of strategic goals. So like increasing profit or something. Well, you might have four or five strategic goals as an organization, but they're not all created equal, right? So maybe the profit is the highest priority goal and then reducing costs is kind of secondary. We found a lot of organizations in 2020 that really struggled with this, which because they had a fantastic annual plan. They had a very clear like idea of what this was going to look like, but then COVID hit and they were in complete and total, you know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh, all the goals that we had are actually not as important now as these other goals because either our business like took off or our business tanked or, you know, a bunch of other things, right? So taking a look at a list of, um, in this case, you know, strategic goals or objectives and then ranking them in terms of like how important they are relative to each other, okay? So that's ranking your strategic goals, understanding not all goals are created equal. Um, and then being able to vote as an individual versus as a team on how um, how each individual project or idea or initiative might impact the strategic goals of an organization. So in this case, we have an example, which is, you know, there's a new product launch of some sort. Um, how is that going to impact our strategic goals? Goals, which are improve profitability, reduce cost, diversify revenue, expand brand reach. So as an individual contributor, I am able to go in here and say, you know what, I think the new product launch is going to be good for profitability, not good for costs because we have to do a whole new setup in the manufacturing plant, um, but it is going to diversify revenue and it's going to extend our brand, our brand reach because now we're working with, you know, schools instead of, you know, in, instead of just uh, companies or something. Um, and I think it's going to improve our quality as well. Um, so this is a personal opinion. I click submit and then another project or idea comes into it. So this is not relative, but this is saying, you know, hey, here's an idea that we might work on and here's how that is going to impact our strategic goals. Right. And then the other way, which is we talked about it in terms of pairwise comparison, this or that, which is like, all right, we want to increase profit. Which one of these ideas is going to do a better job increasing our profit? Um, so rather than just looking at it and trying to rank like everything in terms of like one to 40, one to 30, one to 20, however many things are on your to do list or your team's to do list, um, just making an instinctual decision about which one of these is going to do a better job increasing profit. So why are we doing these things? Well, because we want to multiply the, the weight of a given strategic goal 
people against the votes of our individual team members or subject matter experts or managers or whoever we end up having voting on these different ideas and projects, right? And what we're looking for is an output of a list of projects in a priority order, like in a way that has been quantified, right? And so, sure, this might not be what the senior leader or executive leader goes, yeah, like 100%, this is like, this is the list of priorities in exactly this order, but it does give them a place to start from to t in terms of saying, okay, like supplier management portal, like we're all aligned, this is an extremely important priority. So because we're all aligned, like that's definitely something that needs attention and resourcing, like ASAP. Um, then you start looking down here and you say, enhanced KPI dashboards, well, finance thinks that's a really critical priority, as important as a supplier management portal, but marketing thinks that there's other projects that are a higher priority than, um, you know, than enhancing the KPI data. Why is that? And that's a place to start from with a senior leadership team or a decision making team. Like, you know, looking at the differences between how finance might look at it versus marketing um, and making a final decision and being able to communicate that out as a as a decision maker. So again, Straline, it's a it's a prototype right now, um, but I wanted to share that with you. Um, and so just to really quick, so it's like increase profit, social account or upgrade website. OK, I'm going to go ahead and say upgrade website um, or social account authentication. You know, I think that's going to improve profitability, diversify revenue, improve quality. I'm going to submit and then I'm going to see my next one up there. OK. All righty, let's see here. Let me bring up my Dan and let's bring it back here. All right, everyone, you guys seeing my deck again, introducing Straline. So this is a, again, our goal is to provide a tool that teams can use to provide individual votes on what they think the high, you know, the highest impact projects are going to be and to be able to provide that information in a rolled up consolidated way to senior leaders um, and managers so that they can be, you know, make data informed decisions about what work they think is the highest impact and will have the highest impact on the organization's goals. So. Wow, six minutes to spare. So these are the topics we we covered today. So tools, a list, eliminating different things from our list, scheduling time to focus on the individual priorities that we have, trading off between one project and another, or one task and another, one activity and another, setting strategic goals, um, and understanding what those goals are and articulating those to our teams um, and how their work rolls up to those strategic goals, empowering our teams to be able to make dis good decisions. Um, the Ivy League method, both from an individual level as well as a team, you know, what are your top three? Always being able to quickly articulate what your top three, and I have seen this work so amazing with managers, with even customer service teams. I've seen this work really well, which is like, being able to ask, you know, what are your top three priorities today and having someone know immediately what they are and what they're focused on and what what they have to do to feel like they, you know, really provided a lot of value for that day. Um, alignment, right? So alignment of the strategies across the organization, understanding how those strategic goals roll up from a hierarch hierarchical way, empowering our teams to make good decisions. Straline, we did a sneak peek of this. Um, previously, we've always done um, the prioritization matrix, which is actually do in Excel. Happy to share that out if anyone has any questions on that. Um, but this is a uh, Echo's new tool that we're going to be um, launching in the next year. Um, it's actually available now for demo if anyone has a team or um, is interested in a quick demo of Straline and how that could be configured for your team. If you want to try it out, let us know. Reach out. We'll send out a um, information at the end and then the Eisenhower method. So understanding the difference between something that's important, it's due this week, it has a due date, it has a compliance reason why it needs to you know, be ASAP versus understanding importance in terms of things that are really going to move the needle for your organization, for your team and balancing out things that are important versus so not focusing on the things that are urgent this week, but are not as important as those high important things. So that really oftentimes requires people to manage their schedule very well. Oh, questions? All right. Well, if you enjoyed this presentation, we do more webinars um, and we have another one coming up for introduction to project management. Kelly's going to be presenting on that. Really excited. Um, we have Smartsheet best practices coming up. Um, we are a Smartsheet aligned partner. This is a good mid market solution for you know mid teams, mid sized teams um, that are looking for a task management, project management software that allows 
dashboards um, to roll up data across multiple initiatives. Um, it's got great automations and things like that. So we're going to do a smart sheet best practices um, workshop. And then we have another one which is very similar to this, but we're specifically focusing on improving strategic alignment with an organization and talking about the project intake and prioritization tactics um, in a more granular level. So we very briefly touched on the process of intake, um, but we'll be diving a lot deeper and that will be at the end of June. And if you're interested, you can follow us on LinkedIn or join our mailing list. Here's my contact information. I always like to meet new people, um, talk about specific pain points. So feel free to grab time on my calendar um, if you want to dig in deeper to any of the topics we covered today. That's it for me, Melissa. All righty.